Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to watch that video. And I hope that you will find it easier to, um, to understand this poster after you watch that video. So my name is Abdullah Shihara, and uh, everyone knows me as Abdu. Uh, I'm a Fulbright master's student at the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, the College of Agriculture, Open University, USA. And today I'm going to present you the work that we did over the last semester and it's still ongoing. So this research is entitled as sequencing the nucleocapsid of tomato spotted old virus as a step towards understanding the peanut breaking resistance in Alabama. So peanut is a major crop in the US, especially in the three Southern states, which are Georgia, uh, Alabama, and Florida, where they produce two to thirds of the total production in the whole country. So tomato spotted old virus was, fir was first discovered uh, on tomato. That's why it's taken its name as tomato spotted old virus. But today we're talking about the virus on peanut. So the virus is an ambicin single stranded orthotus bovirus that is fitting in a Bonaire family. And I'd like to mention that Bonaire it has viruses that both infect human and uh, actually animals and plants. So sometimes uh, plant viruses act like animal viruses, and that's why I like working on these viruses. So the virus was first recorded in Alabama on peanut in Alabama in the 1980s. And then um, I first, before I go further, I would like to talk about the genome organization of this virus. So this virus is composed of three main segments. The first one is uh, the small segment and it's referred to S and then the medium segment refers to M and then the large segment referred to L. The small segment has two genes. The first one is non-structured silencin protein, which, uh, which is helping the virus to overcome the RNA silencin from the plant by suppressing it. And then the second gene is the nucleocapsid, which is uh, our uh, which did which which we used in this study to do the research on it. So the nucleocapsid it's what's giving the virus its icosahedral shape, and also uh, it is um, wrapping the whole RNA of the virus, forming something called the ribonucleocapsid. And in the second segment, it has three genes: the non-structured movement protein. And from its name, you can guess that this gene or this protein is helping the virus to move from cell to another cell through the plasmodus matter that's are between the cell plant cells. And then the second two genes are uh, the it's called the uh, the glycoproteins and the RGNGC. And these two genes are very um, important for the virus to bind with the N6 stylet, so N6 can take the virus. And in the large segment, it's only had the uh, bloomerase. And this uh, bloomerase is very, very important for the virus replication because the virus is a negative sense, which means it's uh, mRNA complementary. So once it's in the plant, it's not recognized by the uh, the replication machinery of the plant. So in order for the plant uh, to see them, so the virus must convert itself to a positive sense. That's why they carry their own RDRB on, with them, like the whole protein, not just the, the sequence. So they can replicate themselves from negative sense to uh, uh, sort of transcript themselves from negative sense to a positive sense, and then the plant will recognize them and it will start making more copies of them. So as I mentioned, so this virus has a global distribution and uh, it's able to infect over 1,000 plant species, which is like everything that we have. Also, these 1,000 plant species are from uh, 70 different plant family. So that's why this virus is ranked as one of the top 10 viruses worldwide. Uh, also, uh, the virus is transmitted by threps. And uh, in Alabama, there are two major species that transmit the virus. First one is the Western flower threps, which is Franklinella occidentals. And then the second one is tobacco threps, which is Franklinella fiasca. And though, and the threps generally transmit orthotusbo viruses in a uh, persistent propagative manner. And persistent mean that the virus is transmitted during their life, uh, their, their entire lifespan. And then propagate it mean that once the, the insect take the virus, and then the virus will circulate the whole system of the insect, and also the virus is able to uh, multiply and replicate inside the their vectors without causing any kind of harms or infection to threats. They're just multiplied within them, but they don't cause any infection to threats. Also, I wanted to... Um, to, what, to say why it's called ambisense. Ambisense is because the first two segments here, they have uh, more than one gene and each gene of them has its own open reading frame, which read in opposite direction than the other gene. That's why it's called ambisense. But for the L segment, it only has one gene and only one open reading frame. So it read in one direction 
that's why it, it has an, a negative uh, ambitions uh, strategy. So peanut, uh, as we can see, this virus is a big pro problem. So the peanut breeders, they worked uh, very hard to produce a uh, resistant cultivar that stands against the virus in the field. And in this table, they produce us all the cultivar that are in red. They are reported in uh, on the peanut RX guide as resistant cultivar. But our study showed that they are not resistant anymore, and we will see. So they produce us a lot of resistant cultivars and been used for, for so many years. But in the recent year, 2021, 2022, those uh, uh, cultivars been uh, uh, like uh, the severity of the incident of these LLVs and the symptoms were increased in the field. So in this study, we did it because we wanted to understand why peanut uh, uh, is breaking the resistance against TZLV. And then we think is maybe because there are like a mutation in the gene of TZLV that push the emergence of a new strain of TZLV that are able to break the resistance of peanuts. So we started by utilizing the nucleocapsid. And the reason we chose the nucleocapsid to start with is because it has the most data availability on NCBI. So we can use those um, data which are the uh, which found on the NCBI and then convert them uh, with what we get and then we see uh, the difference between them. So our uh, hypothesis is that as I said, the mutation uh, in the genome of TZLV could be the reason to, that push the emergence of a new strain that are able to breed the resistance of peanut. So uh, so is our objective in this study is to is to detect those mutations and report them. So peanut breeders can take these data and then work on producing better resistant cultivars. So to do that, we started by collecting 121 samples that were collected from three different locations in Alabama. As we can see here, the first location was uh, was BARU, which stands for, uh, sorry, this is BARU, which stands for Brunner Agri Agriculture Research Unit. And then the second location was uh, the Wiregrass, which is Wiregrass Research and Extension Center. And in the third location was the Gulf Coast Research and Extension Center. So we sampled all these locations because they are mostly uh, producing peanut in Alabama. And also they are planting cultivars that are listed on a peanut RX as resistant. So we used them for sampling. After that, the total RNA was extracted from all the samples using the total RNA extraction kit and then the CNA was made using specific primers for TZLV. After that, uh, the CNA was, uh, was subjected to the PCR which is the uh, thermocycler PTR. And then we uh, we use specific primers to amplify the nucleocapsid. After that, positive samples were uh, were cloned in PJIT. And then the reason we did not sequence directly from the PCR product is for two main reasons. The first reason is when you sequence from a PCR, uh, from the PCR um, product, you're not like usually getting the full sequence back because you're missing some of the start uh, some of the start of the gene especially the start codon sometimes you miss the, the end if it's like bigger than 1200 base pair so and the second reason is that you don't have a stock of your construct you only have like a pcr product so we transformed all the positive samples after we got them from the pcr we subjected them to the uh, pcr purification using the, the kit that we have in the lab and then we transformed all the positive samples and equal recombinant cells after we ligated them in PJET and vitro uh, and vitrogen vector, and then we sent them for Sanger sequencing. And then we sent when we sent them for sequencing, we sent two colonies from each sample. And then the reason we did that is we wanted to get at least one complete uh, N from each sample. After that, the sequences were uh, were uh, received and analyzed with the NCBI, and then all the sequences were converted from DNA and to protein. And then the reason we did that is the protein is more accurate to give you data. After that, the mutation of these will be uh, the nucleocapsid these will be in uh, amino acids uh, were observed and detected. After that, a phylogenetic tree that resembled the likelihood between the Alabama uh, sequences and the other uh, data that are on NCBI was contracted. So as a result, we found that a hundred uh, sorry there is there is uh, out of one hundred and twenty one sample, we found that there were eighty nine sample were positive, which is a scary number. And then if we looked here, so so as I said, all the cultivars that are in red color, they are listed on a BNAT RX uh, guide as resistant cultivar. And the numbers on the right refers to how many samples were positive out of how many collected. For example, for the, the first one, there were three samples were positive out of four. So we can tell that this cultivar and the rest of them are not actually 
it's not accurate to say that they are resistant or tolerant. They are susceptible and highly susceptible. Like for this one, like I think Georgia 06 is very important and very known as resistant cultivar, but our study revealed that it's like three out of four were positive, three out of four, three out of four from the three locations. And also the uh, some like some cultivars, which is interesting that are not listed on NCP, uh, sorry, on a peanut RX as resistant, they show like good results. Like here, like a AC1, uh, 1026, there were like sample notes, like it's, uh, there, there wasn't any positive sample, but we only like collected one sample. So it's not very accurate or guaranteed to say it's resistant. We may, we may need to go back and collect more sample from this cultivar and then test them for TSLV and C. So 89 sample were positive out of 121. Uh, after that, as I said, we transformed those PCR products into E. coli cells. And then because we sent two samples or two columns from each sample for sequencing, we got 140 complete sequence of TSLVN. We got them back and then the uh, the alignment of the protein with uh, of the 140 samples with the reference genome from the NCPI, we were able to detect uh, uh, we were able to detect uh, seven amino acid conserved mutations within the nucleocapsid sequence, which is very scary. Like we only used the nucleocapsid and we found seven mutations in it. So this table shows you the, the mutation and their sites. For example, the first, this is the reference genome and this is the CZLV of Alabama that represent Alabama. So for example, like in the site that's uh, 42, the I, the amino acid I, it changed it to L. And then here it shows, like this change, it shows uh, across the whole 140 strain that we, or sequence that we got. That's why you call them conserving. And just, this is for you, this is not included in this poster, but there were like so many, so many mutations that were also found, but they are not very conserved. There are like some like individual samples that show them. So we're not sure if there were real changes or not. So we need to resequence them and confirm these mutations. But for this study, we found seven conserved amino acid changes, as you can see here, like in all of them, except one sample here, one sample here, three or four samples here. But the rest of them, the 140 sample, they show these, these changes. So also the phylogenetic tree that we uh, constructed, it, it showed us that the majority of, uh, of the TSWV from Alabama, these are the three, the three location. This is from the uh, BRU, this is uh, WGREC, and this is from the GCREC. So as we can see here, first of all, all the sequences from Alabama, they form like very nice uh, uh, clusters that are very close to each other, which means that they also are uh, like diverse, that there is some kind of diversity between them. And the most interesting thing that we found that most of the sequences <clears throat> from Alabama were very close to Georgia strains, uh, which mean that they are very similar to them or they share some like ancestry roots with them, or they could be maybe moving from like within the two states. We can say from this one or to this one. I think we can just very accurate to say that they just moved between the two states. So all of the Alabama sequences were very close to Georgia strains, more than North Carolina or Asia. But also most interesting, interestingly, we were able to see three subclades. We call them group A, group B, group C. And in group A, uh, it was like a blend of sequences from the three locations from Alabama and Asia, North Carolina, and Georgia. So this subclade suggests that what, whatever we have in Alabama, like the TSLV is very variable and it's not just coming from one source, it's very variable because these strains that are in this group, they share something similar between all the sequences here. And then in a group C and a group B, they uh, they support the, the hypothesis that TSLV in Alabama is very similar to TSLV in Georgia because in this group and this group, only Alabama sequences are uh, are matching with Georgia strain. There is no North Carolina here or Asia. There is no scarce, there is no North Carolina here or Asia. So the next that we did is that we chose one sample from each group that most represent uh, its group, and uh, we didn't want to pick one sample that have one individual change that no no strain show it. We wanted to change one sample that that represent most of them. So 
So we can say like, oh, this change is more accurate or it's real change or it's a real mutation because more than one sample can show this mutation. So we change, like for example, we chose uh, from group A, we show this sample that is a market here with the green uh, star and also here with the, with the green here too. So we showed these samples and then this paper that's published in 1999 supposed uh, to say that uh, it's supposing that the the nucleocapsid of the of the V has two uh, RNA binding region. The first one is hanging from the amino acid number one until the 39, and then the uh, the second region is hanging from the 233 until the 248. So we wanted to see if these uh, three samples that we chose they have some change in the uh, in these regions. So we found that in a group A, the first sample has a change here, but the, the second two samples, they have like uh, changes that are in the core of the, the nucleocapsid, which is still important. So the reason we showed the three samples is that because we want to infiltrate them and, and, and nicotina bentimiana, because we want to see if these mutations affect their localization. So this is the next step that we're going, we're going to do. And I will talk about it later. So as a discussion, as I said before, the, 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 yield, the yield loss of these, because by TZLP was estimated to be around 40 million US dollars only in Georgia between the 1980 until the 1997, which is a very, very big number. So to compact these low, uh, the yield loss, the peanut breeders, they produce as uh, um, peanut lines that are able to resist TZLP. And as I said, they've been used for so many years, but in the recent year, they show uh, uh, symptoms of the virus are increasing in the field. That's why we did this study. And our studies um, first showed that most of these cultivars are not resistant anymore. They are highly susceptible. Like look here, JE12Y, which is one of the most important crops, uh, sorry, peanut cultivar that is resistant. It's seven out of eight. Uh, it's this is positive. So we first showed that most of these cultivars are not resistant. And then secondly, you found that there that only the nucleocapsid, it has seven conservative mutations. And then the phenologic tree uh, showed us that the most of the of Alabama sequences are very similar to Georgia strain. And then as I said, they could be just moving between the two states. And like the, the reason that I can think about like how the virus is moving, as I said, the virus has very wide host range. It's able to infect over 1000 plant species which means that the, the virus can infect everything in its way, on its way. So it might be a hypothesis that the virus can be jumping from a field to another oil plant to another plant until it reach this state, state or it go to this state. So the virus is able to, able to spread. And in the second reason is that the virus, or the second hypothesis is that the virus isn't transmitted by thrips. And as I mentioned, thrips are found everywhere. And also they are very diverse. They have so many species. So the virus, is getting some advantages being vectored by threps. So also it can be moving with, within the threps. And if threps, when they get the virus during the larva state, they can be able to transmit it during their entire lifespan, which means that they will transmit the virus whenever they go. So this is a second possibility that the virus is able to uh, move between the two states. So, so these findings will help the peanut producers to uh, select for better uh, resistant cultivars and breed for better uh, resistant uh, characteristics in the future. So the ongoing research right now is that, as I said, we only sequenced the nucleocapsid, but we also interested to know what did the rest of the genome what would look like? Like when we sequence the, the NSM, the NSS, uh, the GNGC, the polymerase, and see, can we find more mutations or not? And for my own guessing, I think we will find a lot. Because we start with the smallest gene, which is the nucleocapsid. It's almost it's only 700, 774 base pair. And it's it has so many mutations. Seven out of them were conserved along or among the 140 and nucleocapsid. So I'm guessing that once we send them all for sequencing, the full genome sequencing, which is going to be through the Alumina MySeq instrument at the North Carolina State University, we will find and we were able to observe so many more mutations. And in the second uh, step that we're going to do, and it's, it's been uh, happening right now, is that the three samples that represent each group, they will be localized in, uh, in the plant cells. 
to see if the mutation that you have here will change their localization or not. We don't know yet. Uh, we're going to do that in the future. So as acknowledgement, this work was funded by the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology at Auburn University and the National Peanut Port. And then the facilities that were used to do this research at Dr. Martin's lab. And here are the literature cited. And uh, I think I am done. I just need to, uh, yes. Sorry. The last slide has, yes, this slide. So if you have any questions or concerns, I would love to receive them and reply to them with uh, with the rest of the of the lab and my supervisor, Martin. So the two emails that are listed here, both of them are working and I would love to receive your concerns on them. And thank you so much again for listening and for watching this video. And uh, I hope that you found it helpful. Thank you so much.